have to come to you during senior year. Hey, hey. There you go. Now you're thinking. I'll just be like, I'll be like, business cards and whatever you see a senior, you're just like here, leave me alone. Yeah, I'll I'll do a I'll do a, a Slack bot. I'll make a Slack bot that like you ask me anything about senior design, it replies to you with just a link to this YouTube video. <laughs> this is how you choose your motor. Okay, so the the problem, the senior design problem that we'll do is say you're trying to design a motorized wheelchair okay this is one of them this year <laughs> and and uh so they're i mean they have they have a bunch of different like caveats to their project or whatever but this is one of them so one might ask uh okay so what motors are necessary for a motorized wheelchair and what types of motors how should we go about selecting them? How big of a motor do I need? How big of a battery do I need? Like these, these types of questions, okay? So um, let's think through this. And uh, first off, let's go through the, the, like the types of motors that one usually would consider designing with, okay? Uh, let's think about, so let's say, um, uh, motorized wheelchair. So we have a, a type of motor as our first question. Um, well, first I guess is how many motors do you need? You probably need at least two motors, okay? So independently controlled motors. So say the, the two back wheels are motorized and they're independent, so you can like turn and do all kinds of stuff like that. So, uh, so you've got two motors to select. Um, one good type of motor to select is an AC motor. What about in this application? Is an AC motor a good choice? No, why is that? Battery powered. Battery powered. What, what type of power does a battery supply? DC. DC. Do you really ever want to find yourself converting DC to AC? No. No. It's just a bad idea. It's possible, but not recommended. So we don't, we don't want to do the AC motor. Um, we could also look at stepper motors. Okay, stepper motors are good for doing light duty position control problems. They're cheap. Uh, they have a nice feature where you give it a certain pulse um, of voltage and it will move the uh, shaft a predetermined amount, like two degrees or something like that per pulse. Um, Really great for doing small things like if you're going to do like a 3D printer or a CNC machine and you're just going to move something like back and forth to different positions. Um, good for that type of thing. They don't really come very big. Um, you, you can't really do steppers that are very big. They're not super efficient. Um, so in battery powered applications, that's kind of a trade off there. Um, <laughs> Uh, stepper motors are just generally not a good choice for continuous uh, 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 motion of your motor. So if you're going to want to like drive a vehicle with a wheel um, where it's just going to be continuously rotating for a while, it's not a great choice for that. It's much better for just changing positions and stopping. Okay, so. You're thinking stepper, probably not, probably not a good choice in this case. Um, and then you're down pretty much to brushless DC or brushed DC motors. Here, brushless are, they're great. They're more efficient. They are powered by DC power. Um, the, the drawbacks to them are that you have uh, probably about double the cost of a, of a brush DC motor. Um, and 
there are more complicated electronics involved. So there is a question, depending on how you source them, of reliability when you get a more complicated motor in there. Um, and then serviceability is a little bit more challenging because you have a more complicated controller situation. But brushless is really good. Um, brush DC is cheaper. The one major drawback to it, it's a little bit less efficient than a brushless, but the major drawback to the brushless is that the brushes wear out eventually. So you need to service them every so often so that your brushes are not completely worn out. Now, uh, most likely you could get, I mean, for the amount of rotation that your wheelchair vehicle is going to go through in its, in its service life, Potentially, you you would never need like you would say it's like designed for the life of the vehicle. Um, the the brushes are not going to wear out before this machine is is defunct. Um, or you might have like a service thing where like every five years it needs to be taken in and the brushes changed or whatever. It's kind of a it's it's kind of tough to choose between these two uh, on this application. Um, but uh, I would say probably. Brushless DC is is like the um, unless you're going to go with a really high end design, like a really high end design, you probably would go with the brushless. One that's a little bit more economical, you probably go with the, the brushed DC motor. Um, th these motors, I mean, we're talking about a machine that's going to cost thousands of dollars. Probably y your motors are going to be like a, a few hundred of that. Okay, so. You're going to be spending some money on motors. It'd be nice not to have that take up a huge chunk of the design um, cost. So, yeah. So let's say let's say we'll design it with a, a, a brushed DC motor. It's a pretty good choice for a lot of these vehicles that um, are designed on battery powered vehicles. So, uh, great. So that's that's that selection process. The um, then there are questions of like of power, um, torque, current ratings on things, um, and battery. Okay, so these are all related to each other. Now you're going to want to pick some dynamic situation that is like a. a one of the most intense situations, okay? So I, I think, I mean, thinking about this, like, okay, powering this thing on a flat surface, even if it's heavy, uh, it's not going to be too bad. You don't have to go too fast. On a flat surface, not too bad. But when you're fighting gravity, when you're going uphill, that's when this thing is going to be tasked the most, right? So you're going to need to design it to be able to do that, that situation. Um, if you look up the ratings, the ramp requirements for ADA, it's like it's like seven to like fourteen, I think, degrees uh, for the ramp angle. And I would say that that's not sufficient if you're going to for your design. You're going to want to probably go to a higher angle, um, at making it so that your vehicle can go up a higher angle than that. Because, I mean, that's a pretty light slope. So you're going to run into situations where there are more extreme angles uphill on a sidewalk even could be more, more than that. So you're going to want to be able to do a, a decent uh, angle here. So it's going to do uh, sort of a little sketch here. Um, we could draw this on a ramp with a slope theta, and we could look and see, okay, what is the uh, force of gravity? What is the component of gravity that's fighting you? What's the downhill component of gravity? Do you guys remember the trig? Yeah, so it's the force of gravity times, um, it's the sine of theta because the higher you get up with that, the larger this component's going to be, right? Okay. So 
fg sine theta. Um, when theta is 0, this expression is 0, right? So that's the force that you're going to have to fight against. We'll call that the force source. Okay. And we'll, we'll probably just leave theta in there as a variable, but we'll want to we'll wanna plug in at the end, once we have our dynamic analysis, different values of theta and see, see how it would perform, right? And, and so going uphill at a constant rate is one situation, but more uh, extreme than that would be needing to start, right? Needing to go from stopped on a hill to going up the hill. Okay, we all know that that's a more challenging situation, right? Um, so that's probably the, the design uh, requirement that we're going to have. We're going to say for some theta, let's say for, this is a design requirement, uh, for some theta, Let's say um, 30 degrees would be a, probably a pretty good place to, to start. But we could vary this at the end and kind of see where we're at. Uh, for some theta, 30 degrees, um, we, want, um, we want to accelerate. from stopping, from rest, uh, to maybe one meter per second. I mean, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good clip. It's not super fast, but it's, it's an okay clip to be going. To one meter per second in some number of seconds. How, what do you think, five seconds maybe to accelerate up to that speed? You, you, wanna get, you don't want it to take like 100 seconds to get up to that speed. Um, 0.5 seconds. Yeah, 0.5 seconds. <laughs> You're just like <laughs> peeling out. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's, say, let's say five seconds. Um, OK, so that's the situation we have. It's going to be a dynamic response, right? This is not just like some constant torque situation. This is from rest generating torque to go uphill and doing so within your parameters because you're going to have a battery that's going to have a max voltage, you know, whether that's 12 volts or 40 volts or whatever it is. Um, and you're going to have a, uh, you know, a, a battery that can only supply a certain amount of power, okay, that can only supply a certain amount of current, and you're going to have motors that can only handle a certain amount of current. So when you do this design, you change like the angle that you want to be able to go. Um, the other parameters are going to change too. So we do we do a dynamic model. We would then be able to solve this or simulate it, either one. Um, and we would want to say, okay, ha what happens if I put in like max voltage to this motor for five seconds? Do I get up to? one meter per second in, in, in those five seconds, or is it going to take longer? Okay. And then you would say, OK, if, if it's going to take longer, if I need to increase the torque here, I'm going to have to change the gear ratio or the motor. Okay. Or maybe I need to change the battery so I can get a higher voltage, or the driver so I can put more current through. Um, so these are all parameters that are going to be design parameters, right? And doing this in a connected way, where you say, okay, if I change this parameter, the, all these other parameters change dynamically. That's that's a way to do a good design for this. Yeah. So power is actually the, the voltage and the current, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it depends on, so what we'll do is we'll do the dynamic model of it. We'll say, okay, if I put in this voltage, how much current is going to su be supplied? Um, so typically what happens is you have batteries and motor voltage ratings and you want your you want your motor to be able to handle like a full voltage from your battery. 
um, that's a pretty good like matching condition. If, you, if your motor can handle way more voltage than your battery, you have too much motor. Sometimes that's okay. Um, sometimes that's just the, the cheapest motor, the cheapest option, or the most performant option. But uh, where you can get into a little bit of danger is when your battery can supply more voltage or more current than your, than your motor can handle. It's okay if that is the case. You just have to be careful uh, when you apply that voltage or current. You have to have like safety features on there so that it doesn't overheat or something. Um, so in determining that, you're usually trying to match. So you say, okay, what are the, you know, you, we'll do the analysis. We'll say, okay, this is about how much torque we would want to supply. Uh, you look at motors with that, with that like starting torque and or like that. Yeah, you could look at the torque curve, but probably like the starting torque is where you'd look. And you'd say, okay, uh, for these motors, a lot of them run at, you know, 24 volts or something. Uh, so I'm going to want to look at batteries that are 24 volt batteries. Like that, that would be one way to start looking at it. And then if you find, okay, I need more current, um, then you would look for a 24 volt battery that supplies more current to you. Or... Uh, the other thing that's going to increase our torque here is a gear, is a gear ra uh, ratio. So if we have a gearbox in there that's got you know like a 12 to 1 ratio, we can multiply our torque by 12, which is nice. Um, so almost always in these situations, when you want to have a low speed, relatively low speed output, you want to put a gear box on there um, because motors are typically better at giving you speed right out of the box and they are giving you torque. So you want to usually beef up that torque um, and work in that operating range where your, your motor is um, uh, not having to handle all this current coming through and supply all that torque by itself. And that, that's not really much of a trade-off for you, right? Like it's, you don't need to get to super high speed with this, so that's totally fine. We, we'll give up speed all day to get more torque. Um, in this situation and in many situations that's, that's usually the direction that the gear uh, reduction will go where you're going to reduce speed and increase torque yeah i was under the impression that dc motors were better in the torque they are providing torque than the ac <laughs> they are they are better at providing torque but it's uh uh almost always so so the gearbox, what it does for you is it allows you to get away with a lot less motor. So you could probably get a DC motor that right, you know, without a gear reduction, you could easily drive these, these wheels. But you'd run into um, an issue where you're going to be putting a lot more weight on it, a bigger motor, it's going to cost more uh, than you really need. So it'd be much cheaper to put on a gear, a, a gearbox, and the gearboxes are Relative to the motor, they're free. I mean, they're, they're very, very inexpensive compared to the motor. So you, you get a gearbox, reduce it down, and you increase your torque a lot. You reduce your speed, you increase your torque. So that's probably what we're looking at here. And what we'll do is we'll do a model. where We know we're going to have a gearbox in there. We know we're going to have this transduction from the electrical to the rotational, and then from the rotational to the rotational in, to, in the gearbox, and then from that rotation to translation, right? And so we'll do this dynamic model, and then at the end, you would, you would plug in your parameters, you would estimate each of these parameters, you do your dynamic model, and you say, okay, for this, for this uh, DC motor and, and for this battery and whatever, I, I could you know, plug in 24 volts at full power, for five seconds and we'll see what would happen and you see what speed you could get up to in that and if it if it's like a hundred meters per second well you've probably overshot you probably could do a lot less motor um, than you're doing or you might find that it just hits your spec but your your current that you were flowing was too high okay maybe your motor handles 24 volts but it can't handle more than five amps for a couple seconds so it can't handle it maybe you were putting in 20 amps it can't handle that so what you're at that point you're looking at probably if you're only just meeting your speed spec after five seconds you need all that torque so really your only option there is to give yourself a, a greater gear ratio um, 
and increase your torque that way. And then go back. And if, if worse comes to worse, you might have to change, you might have to change your motor so that it can handle more current. Um, there's like, so those are your options. You have different options there in terms of gear ratio, in terms of your motor selection, in terms of your battery selection. But uh, uh, seeing how these all affect each other in a dynamic model is key. So saying, okay, I, I know that my, uh, my, like, ideally I would get this much torque for five seconds. That's an okay thing to do, um, but what's better to do with the dynamic model and see, okay, how much current would really be flowing in this? How fast would I really get, you know, how fast would I get up to? Uh, maybe it would be way too high, uh, or maybe it would be way too low, or maybe I'm just meeting it, or maybe my gear ratio can be increased. Maybe I've maxed out my gear ratio. I can't get a better gear ratio than this. So you, you have all these different things to play with, and when you're designing, you don't always know when you start which, you know, what your, which ones you should be selecting. I mean, we have an idea, like, okay, this is going to be a pretty heavy thing, so we're going to need to have a decent amount of power. But you can't, you can't ask for too much power because the battery is going to be taxed, right? So um, uh, power on a battery, they, they'll heat up if you ask too much power from it. So you, you, you don't want to um, overtax that. You, you don't want to overcurrent your motor. Um, so there are these different parameters that we want to keep or these variables we want to keep an eye on in this dynamic situation. Um, so what I would recommend is doing, the, is doing the dynamic model. So I would say, okay, you've got your voltage source, and that is the battery, but the battery is going to be connected to a motor driver, okay? And the motor driver, what it does is it, it essentially acts as a gate for your battery power. Okay, so the, you don't want to necessarily apply full voltage or nothing, right? You want to uh, supply some voltage in between full voltage and nothing. And so the motor driver allows you to just tell it, like, okay, put in this fraction of the full voltage, and it'll do that. It'll put in that fraction of the full voltage. So your motor driver is is key. It'll supply some variable voltage. The windings will have some resistance. The windings will also have some inductance, L. And you'll have an interaction here through the motor constant with the rotational mechanical system, which, you know, your, your J here is going to be the motor J, which comes as a spec, usually, for your motor. And then it will also have uh, the moment of inertia of the wheels, say. Like that's some significant rotational moment of inertia that you've got, got to, to handle. And there's going to be some... Lump model that? I would lump them together. I mean, you could put two Js here, but then you would just combine them into one. So, yeah, I would lump it into... I would say, okay, the rotor plus OJ, I would say J. Rotor plus wheels, wheel. Um, and I would say that you'd also need to have a, a bearing damping here. Um, you're going to have bearings internal to the motor. That's going to come as a spec, typically. So your uh, uh, motor bearings and then plus the external bearings which you'll have you know at least a couple of them and what, what I do to figure out that parameter oftentimes uh, that's the hardest one to come up with J is pretty easy you're like okay it's a wheel it, you know it's have most of its mass out here we'll say that it's a thin hoop MR squared is J you know that that sort of thing um, B is a little more challenging. One of the things that you can do, this is how I will typically estimate it sort of as like an off the, off the cuff sort of estimate is I'll say, okay, whatever the motor um, bearing damping is, it's probably got one or two bearings in there. 
probably got two bearings in there, but we'll say it's just one bearing in there. And it's got that that damping. We'll add, we'll count however uh, however many bearings we've got. So say so you've got two external bearings, and you were saying there's one internal bearing. Then I'll take the the data sheet B, and I'll multiply by three, and say okay. So if these external ones will say have the same sort of bearing damping. Yeah. If there's going to be a gearbox, would we would that be lumped into this B, or would there so, be another? So so the gearbox you could put it in this B, or you could put it. So we're going to put the gearbox in here now. So we'll have this gear interaction. It's the same ground, right? There's still rotational. Um, so this is going to be one, two, three, four. Uh, you could have the gear if you want. You could have a separate B over here. It, it's sort of up to you the what you're going to do for your bearing damping. If you want to take that into account for the uh, the gears on this side or that side, it, it is essentially this, the same, whichever, whichever way you, you cut it. So, um, and then on this side, so let's say we lump them all in here, plus gear. Uh, and then we have an interaction with the translational system, right? So the translational system, so five, six, it's got a mass associated with it, right? Um, we'll, we'll ignore damping. It's, it's relatively low speed, right? If you move something fast through air, then you got to worry about that aerodynamic drag. But we're not going super fast, so it's probably not a big deal. Um, we'll also have this force source here, which we didn't draw a direction, but um, Let's say uphill is x positive, and we'll say that fg will have said is going this fs is going this way, so it's actually going away from the node of application. Fs equals fg sine theta. Okay. So, and we could we could simulate it with some variable fg like we could try out a situation where theta is zero for a while and then suddenly theta like increases and we could see like how it responds to that situation but i think we've chosen the most extreme case of being stopped on the hill uh, in terms of seeing where the maxes are going to be of our different variables um, so we could do this modeling what's so the the three to four is the gear ratio this is the motor and then uh, this relationship here was the, the wheel, which takes the rotational motion and turns it into translational motion. So um, R, the radius of the wheel, is going to be the, the important parameter there. Um, that'll define our transformer relationship. And here's our you know, lump parameter model. And it's pretty good, and it's pretty linear. I think you could probably come up with a pretty good uh, model of this. I mean, you, you might be off by 10 20%, but if your design depends on something being correct at 10 to 20%, uh, you would probably need to go back and really nail down some of these parameters. Um, so you'd go and you do your simulation. You'd see as your outputs, like I would choose as outputs, here, um, I would say interesting variables are like going to be the current, the current on in the motor. So like I one, um, the torque that the motor is going to supply T two will be interesting to us. Um, we're also going to be interested to know. I mean, the rate, the angular velocity of the wheel might be interesting. Um, the the gear possibly interesting. Um, what's probably very interesting, though, is the velocity of the mass. Right. Um, that's probably that's probably a good place to start for your output. But you could choose more, right? You could choose however many outputs you want, and then you'd go. Do your analysis, find your ABCD matrices. 
And next semester, I'll teach you how to solve these analytically. But for now, I mean, you can just use MATLAB to simulate it, right? So A, B, C, D matrices in the script. Run it. See what your current looks like. See what your torque looks like. Yeah. Can you also like add a screen mask system to the like if you want to analyze the vibration? Yeah. So depending on the type of analysis you want to do, I would say in this model, you're mostly interested in sizing your motor and your gear ratio and your battery and, and all that. So in this analysis, you're not focused on that. But say um, another aspect of this that would be interesting is, does it need some sort of suspension system? Like say you went over a bump that was a certain height. Uh, what kind of acceleration would the person sitting in the chair experience. Uh, so designing your suspension system, you might look at this as being a problem of being like a, um, a mass that has spring and a damper and has you know some follower wheel that's going over some terrain, okay? And so this would be an input position or velocity. And we would want to see what kind of, like, what kind of acceleration does this, does this experience? And reducing that by changing, like the, like, the materials that you're using for your suspension. Like, maybe in your suspension, um, you're not using actual springs, maybe you are, maybe you're using foam or something like that, or rubber to dampen out the, the vibration. So we'd want to say, okay, what, you know, we would do a model of this mass vibration um, from some uneven terrain, and we would want to say, okay, you would want to be able to go over a bump of, you know, whatever height, the requirement would be, you know, being able to go over that bump without experiencing more than a certain acceleration in the chair. So, like that—that's the type of analysis you would probably do. Um, I, I would say, in this case, it's probably best to decouple those two, those two analyses. Um, you could couple them. You could put them in the same model, uh, but I don't know that. I, I can't think of a good reason to, I guess, um, to do that. Um, yeah, possibly. I don't know. You could think about if you'd want to couple it or not. Um, but I think that probably this problem is separate from the other one, or you could separate it out to simplify things. Yeah. Yeah, so any, any questions on on that. Of course, you could always get more complicated. I mean, in this vibration question, you know, you've got four wheels in contact. So, like, one wheel is going up and the other one's going down. And so you, you have all that, which you could try to take into account. Um, that would require, I would say, a 3D dynamics problem. Um, and then you're your model's getting pretty complicated. It's doable. You can you can do it with linear graph techniques. I'll send you guys, there's not a lot of material on 3D dynamics in uh, with linear graphs. Like, I think it was the 90s, some, somebody was working on it for a while and came up with a way to do it. Um, I don't know if there's an actual textbook on it. I think it's just papers that have been written. So I'm happy to send that out to you guys if you're interested. Uh, when you go to those big complicated dynamics models, um, oftentimes you'll write the dynamics down and then you'll simulate the dynamics based on the equations that you write down, like the Newton's laws and the kinematic equations. You can simulate it based on that. Um, although these methods are, you can couple them with that more complicated modeling technique, but it's... Uh, still kind of an area of research. People haven't really come to like a solid, like this is the best way to do it. So, question. Do you have to ford a river in this wheelchair? Do you have that <laughs> Or 
What if there's a strong headwind? So, uh, the river thing, I don't know. I'm sure there's some way to do it. Uh, the headwind thing, what I would say is uh, that's, going to, that's going to produce some force. So you could say, okay, if you have a headwind of whatever some pretty strong headwind would be, um, you would find out what that velocity would be. And then you would try to look up if there's some data on like different cross sections in that headwind. You can do a calculation too based on like cross sectional area that's in a wind. You can figure out what force is going to be applied. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll apply a pressure to the front. It's going to be greater than the back and it'll have a differential force that's opposing motion. Uh, and you could estimate it as a force then. And I would put that in there as like a, a constant force. I mean, you could put it in there as a variable force. It depends on the speed of the wind. Um, and then you could say, OK, say you're going at this angle with this much headwind, and then do that simulation. Or like a variable headwind and a variable angle, you could do that simulation. So I guess what I was kind of thinking is, are we, are we going to learn to do fluids? Models. Ah, yeah, we are. Um, not usually, uh, yeah, not, not usually that so much. Yeah, it's like we're going to do bulk fluid flow modeling. So like, say you want to figure out how much, um, like what the, what the fluid level in a tank's going to be over time when you've got like a pump over here and Whatever. So we're not going to get into the detailed fluid flow. We're going to get into bulk fluid flow and say, okay, if you've got a pipe that's got, you know, this cross section, and you've got this pump here that's pumping through this, and it's got an orifice on this end, and it's open to air, and like th that sort of thing, we will do. So we will do fluid flow in a bulk way, where we're essentially trying to capture what fluid uh, or where the fluid is and how much of it there is and how fast it's going. Okay. Yeah, and, and in that way, we'll very much be doing um, like averages, right? So like all the fluid in a pipe is not moving at the same speed. So what we'll be using is like an average speed in the pipe. And we'll be using, they don't have the same exact pressure profile everywhere. You guys are in fluids right now, right? No. no, next semester you'll be doing fluids. Yeah, so you guys will be doing um, a much more detailed fluid flow analysis, whereas we'll take it in bulk. And we'll say bulk fluid, which is actually oftentimes what you want. Um, if you're trying to figure out, like, how's my control system going to work for, like, keeping the height of this, this like, uh, reservoir at a certain amount, um, you don't really care that much about what the boundary layer is going to be on your fluid flow. Yeah. Is that another way of saying that the fluid mechanics next semester is not worth it? Absolutely not. Um, Absolutely if you definitely. if you want to design like if you want to design an airfoil, for instance, or like some anything that's going to be moving through air quickly, uh, understanding fluid flow over different shapes, different bodies, how you would come up with the drag on that body. Very important stuff. So, Wait, do we count air as a fluid in fluid mechanics? Yeah. Can we get like a doctor's note from you saying that we don't need to take thermodynamics? Ah, no way. Yeah. No way. It's always been a fluid. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Hey,